Hi, I'm Susan Wads, and my debut novel has been acquired after years of <laughs> trying uh, by Regal House Publishing. And along with eight other authors, these books, my book and these books, will be published uh, in the spring of 2024. And I just thought it would be nice to get to know these people, these other authors, and I think you should too because these are going to be amazing books and getting to know the authors ahead of time um, should be really fun. We'll talk about process, we'll talk about submission and rejection, um, inspiration, characters, genre, all that. Uh, the first of these conversations is with the lovely Diane Josefowitz and I hope you enjoy. So I'd like to set up some conversations, some, just some conversations about our writing process and uh, what it has taken to get us here. And um, Diane has mm -hmm. graciously agreed to be the first of uh, the authors to talk to me. Because <laughs> none of us know each other, I don't think. Um, we were selected from, uh, as I understand it, 25 shortlisted and nine of us were selected. Um, so Diane, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about just the process that it took to get this particular novel where it is? Like just, you know, when you started to write it and maybe how many rejections you received. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So this, I've been writing for a long time and this, um, particular piece uh, was one of the, the things I've written the fastest. Um, I don't exactly know when I started a draft of it, but it was within the last year or two, something like that. The draft, it's a short novel. Um, it's only, I think it's just over 20,000 words um, and it came together pretty quickly. Uh, and um, as soon as I had a really a second draft of it, I felt like it was ready to go. Uh, and I, um, I began to submit it. I, I don't know, uh, I think I, I probably made 40 or 50 submissions uh, of, the, of the book, um, but it was, um, it was picked up right away uh, by another press, uh, which then um, broke the contract. Uh, and so, <laughs> so I had a sort of a disappointing first, um, first round because it got picked up very quickly. I withdrew it from everywhere that I had submitted it to. And then um, the publisher reneged on the deal. And so um, I began to submit it again. And um, at that point, um, Regal House picked it up um, pretty quickly. So it was on submission, I think probably for, for four or five months uh, total, which is totally um, exceptional. For me, uh, the book that I um, I've got a novel coming out this May, on uh, May of 2022, and that novel um, I finished. It's 2022, this year, and that novel I finished in in 2009, uh, and and then I shopped it around. It didn't go anywhere. You know, I revised it. I let it sit. Forgot about it. Kind of um, continued to submit, and and I got many, many, many rejections from you know all over town uh, for that that book, and. Um, it, it finally did find a home uh, with flexible uh, flexible press in Minneapolis, but that is is for me um, more typical uh, that that kind of um, long disappointing process. <laughs> this other this book for Regal House was a very short um, and pleasurable uh, situation. Nice, yes, as you say, the the, the other way is uh, much more experienced of you know long writing process and a lot of a long oh. submission process so that's that's great that you I got think that. it's typical too yeah yeah um but you are extremely well published as i as i can see from your your bio you've got lots of shorter pieces so you've got a platform already thank you uh, I, I guess yeah i you, know, you could say that i mean i wear a few different a few different hats uh, but yeah, I've been, um, I've been writing, uh, I guess, I don't want to say professionally, I, I, regularly is probably the most accurate thing to say. I've been writing regularly, you know, on a daily basis uh, since I was um, in my 20s, which is a long time ago now. And um, with that kind of time, uh, one does build up a body of work and um, it does find its way uh, out uh, into the world. Um, you know, so and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bold about um, submitting. I don't have too much trouble uh, being rejected, <laughs> as, it, as it turns out, I feel like I shouldn't say that. It seems to, I don't want to invite more rejection, but I, you know, it's it's part of the job. And so after a while, if you submit a lot, 
you know, like, a, you know, a bunch of stuff does get, get published. That's very true. And I think it's good to know when if people are listening and those, especially those starting out on the journey to understand that just because they've submitted a piece to one place, it's, you know, it's not generally going to get published right off the hop. Yeah, that one shot um, at once and done is not really, um, my experience, that's not really how it works. Now and then I, I, I'll finish a short story and it will, you know, it will be accepted immediately often to a place where I know the editor already and they've already published my work and they know they already like it and they're looking for more material. Um, but that's very much the exception rather than, um, than the rule. I don't know how it's been for you. It might be different. Uh, you might have a different story, but um, I do feel like mine is pretty typical. Yeah, and just knowing that we have to submit many, many times uh, the same piece, I find, you know, some of this, they'll only submit it to one uh, publication. I think, no, don't do that. Submit it. If you, if you like your piece, send it out to as many as you can find that's a good fit. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that um, I think got us these uh, contracts with Regal House is uh, is in our interviews, we really had to show that we were going to be an advocate for our own books. And so my question to mm -hmm. you would be, what are you doing? Um, like it, we, we had a just so our listeners, our viewers can know we got a 62 page uh, guide <laughs> on the things that we were uh, requested and suggested to do. And so what, what, what's your plan for, um, for promotion for your own book? Well, it's, it's a little far out at the moment. Um, I did feel very grateful for that, um, that guide. Uh, I, I do feel like there's a lot of good, um, it lays out a good roadmap. Um, for you know how to make sure that a book is 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 brought into the world um, in you know in the best possible uh, situation um, you know so that the world is sort of primed to receive it and for that you know uh, I like giving readings I like going to conferences um, and so uh, you know I've certainly got that those kinds of plans um, I do go to um, AWP uh, the Associated Writing Programs uh, conference um, I, I was going yearly until the um, the pandemic. Um, you know, kind of, I mean, it's cut into everyone's plans and I'm going this year uh, for sure. It's, it's in Philadelphia and I will be there um, to, to do some advanced uh, publicity for this novel that's coming out in the spring. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that again, you know, it, to, to support uh, the novella as well. Um, and, and I'm, you know, friendly with my local booksellers. Uh, we, have, we have a number of really nice um, independent bookstores here uh, in Providence and in the greater Providence area. And, uh, you know, I buy from them and I, I you know, they know me. And um, I'm looking forward to to events uh, in those those spaces uh, where where I've you know worked already worked to create some um, some relationships. So so you know the, I'll do some local some local work uh, with uh, local booksellers, and um, you know I'll be going to conferences and giving readings. And then I think the um, the other thing I'd like to do is pitch uh, you know a variety of um, articles to various places that are maybe outtakes from the book, things that didn't quite make it into the, um, the finished draft. You know, I could, I could pitch little stories that weren't, uh, that I finally, that I'd had to cut, um, you know, stuff like that, where I have like, I always have extra material uh, that then could be, um, could be published around the time that the book comes out. Uh, and so, you know, my name will be out there in a different context uh, and readers can find, if they find that work, they might also find the book. Right. Yeah, lots to do. And what about um, a couple of other things that they'd suggested were to blog regularly and uh, blog regularly, uh, interview other Regal House authors, yes. um, and that kind of thing. Are you are you onto that that stream? Uh, it's been a long time since I since I had a blog. I got to tell you, it's been a long time, uh, and I I, it, I found that it was. Um, it's hard to write your own blog posts. Uh, you're your own um, editor. <laughs> you have to come up with your own ideas and your own schedule. Uh, and so, you know, like I'm thinking about the blogging really carefully uh, and whether that might be um, and how to do it and where and um, that sort of thing. I don't, I think I'll probably use a website of some sort for it, like um, Medium or, you know, Substack. I'm also thinking about a newsletter rather than a blog, which a lot of people have. 
uh, these days. I don't know if, if you're thinking about that uh, as well, but um, at least with the newsletter, you know who's getting it. Uh, and you have a little bit more information about who your readers are uh, and how, how big your audience might be growing or not, whether it's growing or not. Um, and, um, and people can get directly back in touch with you. Uh, and, but nothing is sort of immediately published to everyone on the, the World Wide Web. So I'm, I'm thinking about uh, a newsletter actually, um, you know, maybe in addition to some blogging, but I, I don't know that I'm going to go back to the kind of blogging I used to do, uh, you know, many years ago, which was, um, it was just all, it was really all absorbing. Uh, and, and so it's hard to do any other kind of writing. Yeah, I find that too. It takes a long time to craft a blog that you want out. You don't want, you know, you want it to be personable. You want it to be interesting. You, It's an essay and then it's free. <laughs> just giving it. Yeah. Um, and right. so I've started to blog again, but it, it's like, okay, what am I going to blog about? I'm not just going to, you know, we about the writing process, about the world as it is, um, because you, you don't want to be flogging your book at, at this point in time because it's not ready yet. So, um, not ready. you want to get exactly. your name out there. Yeah. Right, 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 your right. Your brains there. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I had there was a, something I saw in your bio that I thought was really interesting. The riddle of Rosetta. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, um, by training, uh, uh, I'm a historian of science, and um, one of the things I, I'm particularly interested in uh, is the um, the history of um, sort of humanistic disciplines that kind of cross with the sciences, and one of those disciplines is Egyptology, and so. Um, in 2020, uh, I brought out a book with a, a colleague, um, Jed Buckwald, called The Riddle of the Rosetta. And that was published by Princeton University Press. And it's a history of the um, decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphics. We know, we already know a lot about the history of the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphics. But what Jed and I did uh, was to go a little bit beyond the very familiar story of, you know, um, that this Frenchman, Jean-Francois Champollion, um, you know, basically hitting his head, you know, in the study and saying, oh my God, I have, I finally figured it out. And then, he, you know, sort of presents the decipherment to the world as a fully produced um, uh, scientific object. And, and what we found in digging into that story was that there was a lot more to it. And, um, and so we did, um, we did quite a bit of um, archival research in France uh, and in England uh, to fill out uh, the bones of that story um, a little bit more and, um, and, and kind of position um, both of the, um, there were two competitors for the, um, for the, the, the uh, to, to make the decipherment happen, um, this guy, uh, Thomas Young in England and uh, Champollion in France. And um, they, uh, they were both interesting guys and they both did interesting things. And so we, we worked very hard to take their very different stories and bring them, um, bring them together and integrate them so that their rivalry uh, made sense in the context of each life. If that um, if that makes sense uh, at, at all, so that we have two fully fledged characters who only really interact for a very brief amount of time, uh, and so the book is about is about them, but not them together. And so that's the it was the, the challenge of the book was how to integrate essentially two biographies uh, and tell tell one story uh, about these two um, these two amazing and interesting nineteenth uh, century lives. Wow, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Um... And there are a couple of other things about your bio that really, really grabbed me. Um, one is that uh, you tap dance, which is pretty cool. Yes. Not too many people do that. <laughs> and there was a word that you used in that, that you, you're, um, you were perfecting your bombershay? My bombershay, yeah. <laughs> Still perfecting that bombershay. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> a bombershay is, um, it's a step where if you do it right, it looks like your leg is broken. That um, is the only way that I can. <laughs> I can describe it and it's so like there's a stomp and then you kind of shift back on and put your feet out like this and move one leg and then you stomp again and, and so you look um like you might be in pain uh and if you're doing it right and it's it's really um with a lot in everybody you know you're on a dance floor with everybody doing it at once it's a quick step it, and and it adds like a kind of um it, it adds a kind of uh, density to a performance because you know you see these dancers doing um complicated elegant maybe moves they look they're making things look easy and then there's a moment where everybody seems to be broken and then the, <laughs> then the thing goes on and so it's like it's a it's a cool step it's i i just i i, I can't get enough um of it but i should say that tap dancing is a really fun thing to get into um especially as you age 
uh, it's like, I, I can't recommend it enough um, for uh, stuff like balance and um, uh, flexibility. And um, it's a, and, and also it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful workout and it's super fun. Uh, and so I, I got into it uh, because there's a tap dance studio really uh, just down the road uh, from where I live. And um, it was, you know, kind of more fun than the gym and just about as close. And so, you know, why not? And get into it and I've been doing it for a few years now it's really really fun wonderful so uh, this is something that interests me in particular because I, I'm a body worker and and was a dancer um, uh -huh. and um, I find that my writing is quite embodied it's very it's very physical um, and would would sure. you say that your tap dancing informs your writing or what's the relationship uh -huh. You know, it's funny, um, tap dancing for me, I did, uh, I did a lot of dance as a child. And um, for me, that kind of dancing is a way of, of engaging with those memories. And so I'm, when I'm dancing, I'm quoting to myself a state of, of childhood. Uh, and in my, um, my, my own work, my characters do a lot of this. I mean, the novella that's, that's coming out with Regal House is really entirely um, about a character who is continually uh, quoting states of childhood. Uh, to herself uh, as she um, is trying to understand some of the things that she was too young to understand when they happened to her. You know, she looks back and tries to understand these traumatic events. And so, um, so that's how, that's how it, it links up. Um, my, my experience while I'm dancing uh, is, is um, it parallels uh, the experiences of my, at least of this one character uh, that I've been, that I've been uh, writing about where she is entirely um, absorbed by her past uh, and does quote states of childhood to herself in that, that way. So how do you feel about what is, what's the driving force in your writing? Like from what part of you, what part of you is most alive is maybe what I want to say when you're writing, you know, is it, it, it you know, is it the thought process? Is it, is it the body? Is it, you know, what is your language? You know, um, I think it, hmm. I have about six different thoughts uh, about this, and I think I'm just going to be as direct as possible. Um, I'm I'm interested in uh, trouble <laughs> recollected. I guess that's how I would how I would put it, and um, I'm interested in in how people go back. Uh, and um, process events they can't process at the time. So I'm interested in those moments when something is so it's so horrible it's happening. You're only taking it in in a really narrow way, uh, and then it stays with you. Um, you know the way trauma just sort of sits in the body. And I'm I'm interested in kind of writing about uh, that uh, where the trauma is coming coming is being symbolized. Uh, I guess this is one way to put it after the fact. Uh, and so that's um, kind of where my um, my books come out of. Okay. Okay. So when I hear that, um, I'm thinking about how we uh, integrate backstory into our stories, which is a real mm -hmm. tripping point for a lot of us because you don't want to weight it too heavy mm -hmm. in backstory. What's what's your process? How do you how do you manage that? Because it sounds like the backstory. Of course, the backstory is always, you know, going to be the driving force in a character. What you know, what they, but but right. how, how do you do it? How do you manage it? Well, often I find uh, what I've found over the years of, of doing this writing is that if I wind up writing a lot of backstory, you know, I have notebooks full of backstory and characters and stuff like that. Um, that is the story. And it just, that's not, it's no longer becomes backstory. That is the story I wind up telling, you know, and it might, I might recast it in the present tense. So that is that because it just becomes the, um, the story. Uh, and so that, um, for me, if I'm if I feel like I'm doing a lot of that backstory work, it probably is a signal um, that the story is uh, in that material and not wherever it is that I'm trying to get that story to go. Um, okay. So uh, so yeah, that's um, that's kind of where I where I am with that. I remember, you know, I I, I did get an MFA many years ago, and you know, I remember this being a kind of a sticking point in in workshops. Uh, there was a lot of talk about you know um, how much backstory is too much. Uh, and it was often opposed to the forward motion of the story. Uh, you know, like if you had too much backstory, often there was a, a complaint uh, that the, the story wasn't moving forward in time enough. And, you know, 
I remember taking that very seriously. I no longer do. Uh, and um, it's been kind of freeing to, um, to recognize that. Um, uh, those, the, some of those workshop complaints were mainly, um, if you translate them into ordinary language and outside of the jargon of the workshop, the, the, the critique was, I'm, I'm not ready to hear the story that you're telling, or I don't want to hear the story that you're telling. And that um, for me is enough to, uh, it propels me into a more independent space uh, where I then just you know, keep telling that story. And as I continue to tell it, the story becomes um, more powerful because I'm doing you know, sort of more independent uh, revision that's not um, revision in the service of some voice that's saying you have too much backstory, there's not enough plot, whatever. Uh, yeah, so um, that's I try genius. to be really careful. I love that. I <laughs> oh, love that. And, that. and I think, you know, people need to hear it. Writers need to hear that. It's like um, years ago, one of my instructors had said when I asked him, oh, well, can you do such and such? I don't remember what it was. You know, can I do this? He said, you can do yeah. anything you want Any, as long as it works. Anything. <laughs> anything. That's exactly right. You can do anything you want. You have you are required to do anything you want. Just sort of a funny thing. It's like more than permission. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's important to really dig in and figure out what it, exactly what you want to do and then do exactly that uh, as opposed to um, letting um, you know a, a group of people that you may not know very well you know who may not be sympathetic to your aims or intentions or even understand them uh, that, you know that's not going to help you um, I do think it's worth you know repeating um, you know like with the, when criticism comes in the form of writing workshop jargon uh, often the criticism is only, it's not a criticism at all, it's just a statement of where the, that reader is. The reader is not ready to hear the story that you're telling. And, um, that, and it, I think that's really common. I mean, I think people are often not willing to hear a story uh, that, that particularly literary writers are, um, are telling. And I say that because um, I'm a person who, who watches uh, genre literature with some, um, what, interest, I guess? Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of interested in, in um, writing that comes out and kind of skirts the literary um, category, particularly, you know, so I'm interested in this genre called uh, women's fiction, right, or book club fiction, uh, because that seems to be, um, it, it does look like literary fiction to me, but it happens just to be written by women. Uh, and so it's just not given that literary um, status sometimes. So that's what got me interested in um, in genre. But the other thing I noticed is that um, the, the stories that are told in these more easily recognizable genres are um, stories that everyone wants to hear. You know, like it's just, they, they really are um, stories about um, friendships, women's friendships, uh, difficulties in those friendships, difficulties with, um, you know, female siblings, with sisters, um, sisterhood, those stories come up a lot. Um, and then there are also um, an enormous number of, of novels about, um, you know, about relationships and about affairs and, um, you know, the things that, that undermine um, uh, dyadic relationships. And, and you know, those, those in that genre, those are stories that folks just seem unable to get enough of. And that's what a genre is. Right, in a way, it's like a container for a particular set of stories. And they're not very, there aren't very many of them. It's just people keep telling them in different, the same stories in different ways. And so um, I forgot exactly where I'm going with this, but the, uh, the, uh, the criticism, that, oh, there's too much backstory in your story. It's not moving forward enough. That may be a statement just about, you know, I don't recognize the genre that this is in. Uh, and this is not a story I want uh, necessarily to hear. Okay, um, so a couple of questions came up as you were as you were speaking because um, even though you know my protagonists are all women and they are you know relationship stories in the end, um, sure. I've shied away from uh, giving it the label of women's fiction because because I think it it limits the readership and um, it sure does. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't want that. I I think that the you know the themes and the whatever they're they're universal just because they happen to women. Um, you know, that there are some that are specific, some issues obviously that are specific to women. But I I just you know I I always hover like no women's fiction. I want it literary fiction. I think you know it's it it gives you more freedom um, to not follow sure. like the three act structure or the you know 
whatever you know those those uh, parameters yeah. that are that are fixed on to yeah i don't know i just so what are your thoughts you, you you know you say you're following women's fiction but don't you think that it somehow limits your your potential readership yes I'm, i i completely agree um it, i feel like it's and it's limiting to me as a as a as an artist uh, as well um and you know saying that i'm also aware that it's a marketing category and and i guess people who want to sell a lot of books really need marketing categories, they do, I mean, because it's a big industry and bookstores need to know what they are putting on their shelves and how to, how to, where to put books so that the right readers find them. Uh, and you know, that's sensible, it makes sense. Mm, that said, uh, I, I have been frequently mistaken, uh, I guess is how I feel about it, mistaken for a writer of women's fiction. Uh, and you know, where you know an agent will acquire a book for me. Um, this happens. This has now happened twice. Uh, you know, and and you know they'll, they'll sign me to to produce a particular book, and um, you know the book is written and they want it. You know, supposedly then you know they like begin to to do some edits, and it starts to turn out that I can't seem to deliver um, the particular genre of work that they uh, really want, and. Um, I, so this is why I watch that um, that genre because I feel like I'm I, I'm I'm often pressured into that category um, or toward a category of women's fiction and I don't understand it. Um, oh, I'm you know, so glad you said new, that because I don't understand it either. Because as I understand <laughs> genre fiction, that, that there's a kind of a template that you know it has yes. to have certain elements in it and it has to have a, a kind of an ending that's like this and um, right. Is, and is that what you're saying? So you you produce your work and they go, well, no, it's not. It's got to be like this. Yeah, they I produce it. You know, it goes out in the world. You know, an agent will pick it up and say, oh, I love it. And then try to take it and fit it into um, some hole or slot. And it needs to be shaped in order to fit it into the slot. But they can't tell me the shape of the slot. And neither, I mean, and I can't figure it out. So, so there's there's often a, a real um, breakdown, uh, right, uh, around that um, that situation, and and um, you know it's just it's unfortunate because I do think the uh, the enthusiasm for the work is real. It's just that it doesn't translate into um, being able to uh, make use of the um, the manuscript in the way that agents like to make use of manuscripts by selling them. So selling them. you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Where am I going to put it on the shelf? Who's going to buy it? And you know, right. like, who's going to buy it? Who are and, your readers? Right. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to read my book. Come on. <laughs> well, you know, I, I sort of I want to say that a small press like um, like Regal House gives gives me a certain freedom to find my own readers. You know, so, you know, going out, giving, doing readings, um, you know, going to, um, for instance, my local farmer's market and getting a table and selling my books there, where I get to talk to people about the books, uh, that, those kinds of um, audience building efforts are, are, are really important, uh, I think, to our publisher. And, and, and it, it takes some of the uh, mystery out of, uh, out of um, who is your reader? You know, like, if I can tell you, like, well, actually, I have, you know, I have 10,000 people on my mailing list who I've all spoken with, you know, personally. Yeah. I know exactly who my readers are and what they want, right? Like 1,000 or whatever, you know, like, so, so um, it takes that question and makes it very concrete. Who is your reader? Well, I can, I can yeah, hope to be able to say exactly who they are. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this person I, and this person. I, um, the first two chapters of this book were, uh, won a contest a few years ago with Lazuli Literary uh, and, um, so that was really lovely. So it's kind of like that's already in place. And um, yeah. uh, one of my uh, friends who has a small press herself, she she printed up some arcs for me way back when, when I had oh. my final manuscript. And um, right. so it looks like a book, <laughs> you know? So when I yeah. go to readings, I read from the book, but um, I was stunned at one reading that I did because this, you know, man in, well, I don't know, late fifties, early sixties came up and he said, where can I buy that book? I'm like, but you're yeah. a man. You want to read this book, <laughs> you know? And so that was that was really lovely um, to to hear that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, well, that's why I don't want to like if I if that was on the shelf in the women's fiction section, that man would never find that book. Right, right, right. So we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not doing that. No. <laughs> no. 
Okay, and um, but, uh, just just a sort of a technical question. Um, when when you're writing, uh, you know, in the process of writing, do you do you tend to read your own work aloud in the process of writing, just to, to, yes. to feel it in your mouth? I do. Mm -hmm. I do read it uh, quite a bit. I, I, I do most of my reading out loud toward the, um, once I've got the whole story put together, when I'm really working on the language and going line by line, uh, reading it out loud um, is, a, is, a, is a vital, um, it, it's just an essential part of my process. But I'll also read aloud when I'm stuck. You know, yes. it, it, to hear it out loud, it's a new lens on, on the story. And as I'm reading it out loud, I might have a new idea about how it should move forward. Uh, so that, that it, it tends to be a good way to get, for me to get unstuck. Good stuff. And are you part of like a reading, a critique group or are you pretty much a lone wolf? I have friends. Um, so I have, I have a, a few friends that I share, um, that I share work with and they share work with me. Um, and so we, we kind of work, uh, you know, together, but it's not, it's not a, um, it's not a formal, a formal group. I'm hoping, um, to start a kind of a, a weekly writing practice uh, with a group, um, but but only um, writing very short pieces, like things that you know I would come with a prompt and everyone would write for an hour or so, and you leave with a hundred word story, um, you know that you could then then revise and and you know it would be something like uh, going to the gym, uh, you know <laughs> we'd meet yeah. every week. Yeah. <laughs> we write a hundred words and then leave and come back. And, you know, like just, I would just always be responsible for providing the prompts. Uh, and th that's a sort of workshop I would love to run. Uh, and it could just be, um, it could run forever, you know, as long as I have the, the time and the health to. Um, yeah, no, to it's it. good. I, I highly recommend it. I have a, a group, there's yeah. seven of us um, that I lead. It's a workshop format, but it's uh, yeah. seven of us that write every week together and we're all working on longer pieces. So what's really beautiful yeah. is we watch we watch the the manuscripts evolve and and can comment, yeah. you know, with yeah. with insight onto you know what we've heard before. Um, so that that's been really really helpful for for all of us. Yeah, that sounds great. How long have you been um, together? Uh, it's been about a year. Actually, we started with the pandemic. Like, yeah, it's been ah. a year and a bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> there have been some great <laughs> gifts with the pandemic, I have to say. Yeah, no kidding. Right, right, right. Like this, I wouldn't be able to meet you, you know. Otherwise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this would be impossible. You're in Rhode Island? Yeah. I am. Yeah, I'm in Providence. And you are in Canada somewhere. I am in Canada. I'm in a very, very cold Canada right now. <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's been really nice to meet you and lovely to speak with you. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I'm I'm glad to um, have uh, helped you kick it off, and and I hope it I hope it all you know develops the way you envision.